Well, hello, everybody. Today, it gives me great pleasure to talk to you about calcium. This has been a point of interest since I was a fellow, because we all know that calcium seems to be what's plugging up the arteries. So I have an interest in calcium, and with it, vitamin K2. So what is vitamin K2? It's a vitamin that's unheard of. K1, maybe, but K2? So today, I'm going to teach you about calcium and vitamin K2 and why I'm so interested in it, because I think that this is a very important chapter in our understanding of what's causing blockages in the arteries of the body. So let's just dive right into it. There was another study done called the EPIC study, and it showed that for every 10 micrograms of vitamin K2 in your diet that you take, there's a 9% reduction in cardiovascular risk. I take that any day. Show me which of my medicines can do that. A few, very few. So in the EPIC study, there's a direct correlation. The higher your intake of vitamin K2, the lower your cardiovascular metabolism. Nine, nine. So if you're consuming 40, nine times four. I mean, that's almost 50% reduction in cardiovascular risk. Um, so the references are all listed, and th this was an amazing study. There was another study that was also done in Europe. Where they showed clearly the amount of coronary calcification. Now, you know that I do coronary scans on all my patients to look for coronary calcification. Because coronary calcification tells you that you've got atherosclerosis, there's a direct correlation to mortality, to heart attacks, and that's been well proven. So now, this study showed that there's a direct correlation between vitamin K2 intake and coronary calcification. Direct, direct correlation. So this was a beautiful study. It was published in Atherosclerosis in 2009, showing patients with low vitamin K2 intake have the worst coronary calcification, and those with the highest had the lowest amount of coronary calcification. There was another Dutch study that was done, and they looked at 180 micrograms of MK7. MK7, this is the preparation that we use of vitamin K2. And this, as I said before, comes from fermented products. And it showed not only cardiovascular risk reduction, but these patients had much better bone density, less fractures, strength of the bones as well. This was a 2007 study. Then there were further studies done that the patients who were given vitamin K2 supplements, they had improved pulse wave velocities and carotid artery distensibility. So what does that mean? That means it's improving the elasticity of the blood vessels. How does it do that? Well, obviously, if there's less calcium build up in that artery wall, in the smooth muscle, which I explained to you before, then that artery is going to be more distensible. So if it's more distensible, what, so what? Well, what happens is that the systolic blood pressure will be lower because when the heart pumps into a rigid tube, the systolic blood pressure is going to be higher because there's nothing accommodating that stroke volume. But when there's more distensibility, that means there's more compliance in the blood vessel because there's less calcium, it's less rigid, you're going to get a lower systolic blood pressure. And we know that systolic blood pressure directs has a direct correlation to coronary artery disease, cardiomyopathy, congestive heart failure, and total mortality. So what happens to a diastolic blood pressure? Diastolic blood pressures, patients given vitamin K2 supplements have a better diastolic pressure as well. Because you don't want a very low diastolic pressure. Because a low diastolic pressure decreases coronary perfusion, because coronary perfusion occurs in diastole. So what happens is, if you have vitamin K2 deficiency, you're going to get a high systolic pressure because of non-distensibility of your richer tubes, your aorta and everything else. And you get a lower diastolic pressure because there's no recoil of the aorta because diastolic pressure is caused by recoil of the aorta. So it's a double whammy. You don't want stiff arteries. You don't want calcium building. And by the way, this process of stiffening of the arteries and losing its elasticity starts in your 20s. So I hope you, I have your attention here. It starts in your 20s. By the time you're in the 50s and 60s, if you have not taken care of your vasculature, you're going to have stiff arteries, calcification. Yes, you may not have uh, had a heart attack yet, but your physiology is being set up to either have a stroke, heart attack, or heart failure, leading cause of mortality in, 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 in the Western world. So lots of studies have been done. 
Now, there's another study also with, with uh, vitamin K2 supplementation. They took a cohort of patients, and they gave them vitamin K2, and they found that the, the increase in the coronary calcium can be attenuated. So the control group showed ongoing calcification. It's so easy to do the coronary calcification scores. And here's a nice picture of it. It shows the calcium build up again, just to remind you all. And this coronary calcification was attenuated. You could cause that slope to flatten out with vitamin K2. So you don't get more build up compared to the cohort. The group that was given the vitamins had much less calcification build up. So any opportunity to decrease the amount of coronary calcium and build up in your arteries and to improve your elasticity and your distensibility of the vessels, take it. So I give my patients vitamin K2 and my diet has to improve. Diets of what? Eat fermented foods, fermented foods. So the Japanese eat a lot of natto, you know, N-A-T-T-O, right? That's fermented soybeans, right? right? If you have a taste for it, then you should have it because that has the highest concentration of vitamin K2. Next is hard cheese like Gouda, the hard cheese Gouda, very high concentration of vitamin K2. Then comes other cheese like the Brie, the French cheeses. They have a lot of vitamins in it because it's the fermentation products. The bacteria produce the vitamin um, K2 in it. And then kefir comes in there, sauerkraut comes in there. They also have a lot of vitamin K2, but much less than the first few ones that I already mentioned. So our regular meats have MK4, and our eggs have MK4. If you have farm-raised, free-roaming chicken, they'll have vitamin K2 as well. Uh, but they have to be free-roaming. They've got to be eating what they would normally eat in their normal life, not the feeds that we're giving them. Same thing with the eggs. Um, so any opportunity I get to do that, that's the way to go. And then worst case scenario, the patients who already have some calcification or are very high risk also, I give them vitamin K2 supplementation. So is there any downside to giving them the vitamin K2 supplementation? There is. Everything. So it does affect your PTINR if you're taking Coumadin. So if you're taking Coumadin or Warfarin, uh, you need to make sure that you test your, your PTINR because high doses of vitamin K2 will affect your PTINR. I mean, that's, that's been shown. Other than that, I've not seen any other downside in taking vitamin K2 supplements. How much vitamin K2 do I recommend? 200 micrograms of vitamin K2 on a daily basis. Yeah. So let me just talk a little bit about, uh, you remember I told you I started off by saying there's a correlation between my patients who have diabetes and, and osteopenia, and they seem to have coronary artery disease. Well, let's see if there's a link here. So, we know that vitamin K2 also affects insulin sensitivity. And I'll show you the references for this as well. So if we induce vitamin K2 deficiency in a patient by changing their diet, it produces insulin resistance. When you supplement them with vitamin K2, 200 micrograms, MK7, we show that insulin sensitivity gets better. And remember my previous talks, I talked to you about insulin sensitivity, that these patients who have insulin resistance just by giving them vitamin K2, I'm also improving their insulin sensitivity. Now, why is that? Why is that the case? What's that got to do with this? Well, vitamin K2 is found in high concentrations in the body in certain places. Saliva, extremely high level of vitamin K2 in it. So what's that doing in the mouth? Well, guess what? I got teeth. So vitamin K2 and the saliva in it causes me to deposit dentine. So the higher my vitamin K2 levels in my saliva, the better teeth I'm going to have. Is this all making sense now? That if you have vitamin K2 deficiency, you're going to get dental caries. This has been directly called Western Price. Western Price dentist clearly showed that. He was curing the worst dental caries by giving patients vitamin K2. He called it factor X at that time. He didn't know it was vitamin K2. But he would cure all these people's bad dental caries. He wouldn't pull teeth. He would just give them this, and all of a sudden, all the caries would get better. This is, this is amazing stuff. So vitamin K2 in the saliva is there for a purpose. It's the highest concentration in the body. It's because you wants to keep good dentine. 
Number two, it's in the pancreas. There's a very high concentration of vitamin K2 in the pancreas. What's it got to do with the pancreas? It's got to do with insulin sensitivity. That's what it's got to do with. So that's why when you give vitamin K2, you're boosting your pancreatic function and you prevent that over-secretion of insulin. That unregulated over-secretion of insulin, the incretin response, is attenuated when there's good amounts of vitamin K2 inside the pancreas. And joint disease, I think I already touched on that, that if you don't have vitamin K2, you're not going to activate the matrix proteins in your in your bones, and therefore you're going to get osteopenia. And there's lots of references for this. Now there's another one, Alzheimer's disease. So what's that got to do with it? Well, again, we're not 100% sure, but remember, the vasodilatory capacity of your capillaries in your brain is very important. See, when I do functional MRI studies, you, you, you look at the flow of blood in different parts of the brain, and instantaneously the flow increases here, decreases here, and that's my brain wave activity. How does that happen? Through vasodilation, right? So you vasodilate, you vasoconstrict, you vasodilate. You... And this ability, this microvasculature, uh, uh, automatic vasodilation and constriction, is controlled by vitamins in your, in your blood vessel, in your smooth muscle cells. The further studies showed that with cancer overall, this huge study showed a 30% reduced risk in cancer in patients who had high levels of vitamin K2 or equivalent in the bloodstream. And uh, as I mentioned before, and I'll mention them again, natto, hard cheese, butter, liver, and cod liver oil. Very high concentrations of vitamin K2 in these. And then prostate cancer. There was a study to show that there was less prostatic cancer and spread of cancer in patients who had the highest levels of vitamin K2 in their body and osteodystrophy in renal failure patients. So now, you know, one of the biggest problems with renal failure patients is that they get calcification of non-osseous structures. So when they come to me, oh, I see the coronary calcium score is extremely high, the carotids are calcified, the aorta is calcified, the aortic valve is calcified. And again, those patients used to be given calcium. We don't give them calcium anymore because the mortality is very high. And we feel that this is secondary to two factors, vitamin D deficiency and vitamin K2. Now I've got to tell you about vitamin D at this point because in order to get the optimal function of your vitamin K2, you also need vitamin D. Because vitamin D goes to that same matrix protein and then comes along the K2 and they work together on the matrix protein. So you need good levels of vitamin D as well. That's why we give vitamin D to our patients as well. So vitamin D, its job in the body is twofold. One, it increases the absorption of calcium from your gut. That's what vitamin D does. But vitamin D doesn't then take it and do anything else with the calcium. That job is vitamin K2's job. Vitamin D's job is simply to absorb the calcium into your body. What the destin destination is for that calcium afterwards, whether it's gonna go into a vascular structure or into the bone, that's not determined by vitamin D. That's why if you have a patient with osteopenia and you just give them vitamin D alone, it's not really helping them. But if you look around you, everybody's on calcium supplements and vitamin D supplements, but they're not on vitamin K2 supplements. So this experiment has been gone long enough now. So in spite of, look, all your foods are vitamin D supplemented. There's vitamin D supplementation in your milk. There's vitamin D even in your orange juice. Just about anything you pick up is vitamin D supplement. And yet we have all this epidemic of 25-year-olds coming to me with osteopenia. Oh, yeah, I have osteopenia as well. And I'm surprised. And you, you're drinking all this stuff with so much vitamin D in it and calcium fortified. Everything's calcium fortified. And yet they're osteopenia because they don't have the right chemistry. There you go. And by the way, vitamin K2 deficiency has also been linked to fertility problems. Now... In kids, the development of the face, the arch, the nose, is also related to vitamin K2. So this is, again, Weston Price who, who nailed it down that the, the moms and the kids who were vitamin K2 deficient had premature calcification of the cartilage, the cartilage in their face, the nasal bridges, and therefore they developed small jaws and they developed upper airways obstruction. 
in these kids. So the question is, why did these kids develop this? It's because they didn't develop their face properly because of premature calcification of the cartilage. So the, you know, everything closes after a while and that's it. Now, no, no, the cartilage cannot, uh, because it's, it's been calcified. So narrow arches. And by the way, they, they say that you can actually detect some of this in utero. That this, that this baby is probably vitamin K2 deficient by the way that the facial structure is looking. This is a very exciting area as well, but it shows that the mother's nutrition is exceedingly important in you, uh, during pregnancy to avoid the narrow jaws, the mouth, and, and these issues. So tooth decay I already touched upon, the very high levels that are inside your, your, your your saliva, and we want to keep that going. And by the way, you know that patients who have bad dental caries, they can get low-grade endotoxemia because the gums get bad, direct route for tiny bacterial products to get into your bloodstream. And these products, called lipopolysaccharides, they get into your bloodstream, and they're the ones that displace the cholesterol from the LDL molecule and create small, dense LDL. And you know that it's small, dense LDL that causes atherosclerosis. Not LDL itself. It's when LDL becomes small and dense because it picks up endotoxins along the way because endotoxins can't free float in the bloodstream. So we always look to see what the cause of small, dense LDL is and chase that down and improve the patient's health. So gum disease, very important. So patients, you, you know, they, they, they take these mouthwashes and they have all those chemicals in it. Well, the worst thing you could possibly do because you're just killing off the good bacteria in your mouth and you're replacing them with probably the most hardy ones around. And then you wonder why there are more dental caries and it doesn't really do anything for the breath because breath comes from something much deeper. So I'm not in favor of those mouthwashes the better thing to do is to take a good probiotic and take vitamin K2 supplementation, and you will have a much better mouth. Bacterial flora also improves, and of course your dentine will be very good too. There's data to show that there's direct correlation between dental caries and stroke as well. In closing, I just want everyone to know that vitamin K2 is probably a small molecule, unheard of, but probably exceedingly important in our physiology. And I think that when I, as a cardiologist, see all this calcification in my coronary arteries, I'm always asking the question, why? Where did this calcium come from? What's it doing where it shouldn't be? And I think that those patients, now, I put them all on vitamin K2 supplements. So now, because many of you have been asking, that, Dr. J, why are you putting us on vitamin D and vitamin K2? You know, I came here because I've got a blockage in my artery, well, this is the answer. If you like this video, then this one I strongly recommend it for you. But if you want to see the whole series, please click here.